Namaste and greetings. I, Priyanshi Arora, a researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evam Niti, Anusandhan Sansthan, Nai Dili, extend my warmest welcome to all of you to the IMPRI hashtag web policy talk. Today, we have gathered for a special talk on Prospects for Energy Cooperation in South Asia by Srinivas Krishna Swami Sir as a part of the series, The State of Environment, Hashtag Planet Talks, organized by IMPRI, Center for Environment, Climate Change and Sustainable Development. Our speaker for today is Sir Srinivas Krishna Swami. Srinivas Sir is an economist by training and is currently the Chief Executive Officer of Vasudha Foundation, a not-for-profit think tank, CSO, set up by him in April 2010 and working in the clean energy and climate policy space. Mr. Krishnamurthy has been actively involved in conceptualizing and designing a number of pioneering and unique projects in the space of clean energy and climate policy. Sir designed the first and only multi-stakeholder and source agnostic platform for renewable energy in India called the Indian Renewable Energy Federation. Srinivas Sir also headed the policy unit, uh, unit of Greenpeace in India and prior to that was the head of climate and energy campaign of Greenpeace in India. Sir has also been actively engaged and following the climate negotiations in the capacity of a civil society observer status. We welcome you, Sir. Our discussants for today are Professor Sco Christopher Scott, Udisha Saklani Ma'am, and Dr. Mirza Sadaka Thuda. Professor Christopher Scott is the Morris K. Goddard Cha Chair of Forestry and Environmental Resource Conservation and a professor in the Department of Ecosystem Science and Management at Pennsylvania State University, America. We welcome you, sir. Odisha Saklani Ma'am is a PhD researcher in the Department of Geography at University of Cambridge, England. We welcome you, ma'am. Dr. Mirza Sadaka Thuda is a postdoctoral research fellow at OSCE Academy in Kyrgyzstan and Asia Edge Fellow at the National Bureau of Asian Research in Washington, D.C. Sir is also a non resident fellow at Energy Peace Partners in California. We welcome you, sir. The moderator for today's session is Dr. Simi Mehta, the CEO and editorial director at IMPRI. I would now like to hand over to Dr. Simi Mehta to convene the session, and we look forward to learning from all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Priyanshi, and good evening to everyone from India. So we all know that South Asia is one of the leading consumers of energy, and hydrocarbon accounts for a predominant share of its energy mix. The countries are neither uh, richly endowed with hydrocarbons, nor are evenly bestowed with natural resources and production capabilities. So a consequence to the growing economies of the South Asia has been uh, the creation of um, a structural environment of a region which is deficit in energy. Uh, these countries are therefore meeting most of their energy demands from imports. According to the latest available data from the World Bank, uh, it said that um, there is about 25% of import dependency in Bhutan and about 17% in the case of Nepal. But in larger countries like India and Bangladesh, it is more than 80% of their hydrocarbon demand. So clearly the complementarities in the energy demand, the vulnerability to the fluctuations in the global market, and also the uneven resource endowments underscores the very need uh, to cooperate and to achieve regional energy security. So to discuss the prospects of energy cooperation in South Asia, we are privileged to be joined by Mr. Srinivas Krishnaswamy, um, along with uh, eminent discussants, uh, Dr. Mirza, Professor Scott, and Ms. Udisha. We look forward to an enriching discussion. I yield the floor to uh, Mr. Srinivas. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Simi, um, uh, and a very good afternoon all. I will just share my screen. I'm not sure if my screen is visible. Um, are you able to see my screen? Not yet. Yes. Yes. Yeah, you could go full screen. Yeah, I will do. Sure. Um, so once again, thank you, Simi, and a very good afternoon to all of you. Um, my presentation is basically 
uh, it, it, while, it, while, the, uh, while it talks of uh, areas of energy cooperation, what I've done is I have sort of uh, uh, made my presentation into two broad compartments. Uh, one compartment largely would be on setting the context, which basically uh, presents the energy and emission landscape in South Asia. Uh, that is more to set the context. And the second set of uh, slides would be on the recommendations and uh, uh, on energy cooperation. And it also dwells a little into um, uh, areas that uh, are bilateral, trilateral, quadrilateral arrangements or agreements that are already in place and also on the benefits of uh, taking this forward. Um, so without much ado, let me sort of start off with my presentation. Um, now, just to give you a very uh, quick landscape of the global, uh, uh, the, the global 1.5 degree Celsius temperature rise, where do countries stand? Uh, as for the climate action trackers, uh, recent analysis, uh, even today, all the pledges and targets that have come uh, by way of NDCs and also by way of uh, enhanced NDCs still would lead to a temperature rise of 2.4 to uh, 3 degrees Celsius. So we are still nowhere near, the, near what is required by countries to bring temperature levels to 1.5 or temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius by the end of this, uh, uh, by 2100. So this is where we stand. And uh, uh, if you look at the climate uh, action trackers, very, very recent uh, analysis, it says that no country in South Asia, with the exception of perhaps Nepal, uh, Bhutan, and India, uh, no country in South Asia is 1.5 degree C uh, compatible in terms of their policies, NDCs, and so on. And if at all any country is 2 degree C, it is perhaps Nepal, Bhutan, and to some extent India. Now, again, there are some mixed reactions as far as India is concerned. The earlier analysis of the climate action tracker actually put India as two degrees C compatible, whereas the uh, more recent one that was uh, released a couple of uh, weeks back says that it is insufficient. Nevertheless, I suppose one could debate on that. But I just wanted to set this, uh, put this up to set the context. Now, let's look at the carbon footprint. If, if uh, we are saying that South Asia is nowhere near, um, you know, being two degrees C or 1.5 degrees C compatible, why is it so? So if you look at the carbon footprint and especially the energy sector uh, of South Asia, you would find that most of these countries, the predominant source of energy is, uh, or if you look at the uh, GHG footprint, you would see that energy sector contributes maximum to the uh, GHG emissions of all these countries. Now, the absolute numbers may vary, will vary. It may not be very huge, but nevertheless, you find that in case of Afghanistan, 80% uh, of the uh, emissions from the greenhouse gas emissions of Afghanistan is from the energy. Similarly, Bangladesh is about 39%, though agriculture plays a major role. Pakistan is about 48%. Sri Lanka is about 64%. Nepal is about 43%. Uh, Maldives is 60%. Bhutan is 59%, including Bhutan. And of course, India is 78%. Now, if you deep dive into this, into the energy, with the exception of a few countries, and I'll go back to the previous slides. Uh, <clears throat> in the case of Afghanistan, it is largely energy for power. In Bangladesh, again, it is energy for power. Pakistan, again, it is energy for power. And then Sri Lanka is energy for power. In the case of Bhutan, it's largely transportation because they do not contribute, uh, their energy sector does not contribute to emissions at all because it's largely hydro. So it's largely transportation. Maldives, again, is... Uh, gasoline and petroleum products. And so uh, the bulk of the 60% actually, even in Maldives is from the energy sector. Nepal is again mixed uh, because of the last share of hydro and India out of the 78%, if I had to give you a split up, 50 odd percent is from coal, which is your public electricity generation and about the remaining is from the transportation with some amount of um, uh, emissions from the industrial energy. So to put, it in, to put it in perspective, you would find that the energy emissions is the largest amongst almost all of the countries in South Asia, with the exception of perhaps Bangladesh. The energy sector is one of the largest contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. And within the energy sector, it is uh, energy for producing or the emissions are largely from, uh, from uh, uh, electricity generation, 
whether it is coal, oil and gas, uh, petroleum products, so on and so forth, gasoline and so on. Now, again, let's talk about the energy mix in South Asian countries. So, uh, so this is again, just to add to the context, um, India, you would say 55% of India's electricity power capacity is from coal. It has come down, if, if it was, if I were to make this presentation three years back, I would, I would have said 60 odd percent, 68 percent. It's come down to 55, largely because we've had a fairly large penetration of uh, solar and wind, 100 gigawatts of solar and uh, renewable energy capacity as on date, uh, which is a phenomenal achievement. But nevertheless, we still have a long way to go. 55 percent of India's power still comes from coal. And uh, Nepal, like I said, it's largely oil and gas plays a very minor role. Solar, again, a very minor role. It's largely hydro. So that's why I was saying when I said about the greenhouse gas profile of Nepal, it's largely transportation. Pakistan, again, if you look at Pakistan, uh, sorry, if you look at Pakistan, again, you'll find oil and gas playing a very major role. And so is coal, with uh, solar and wind, very, very minuscule sort of percentage in terms of their share in the overall installed capacity energy mix. Um, Sri Lanka, again, is, is sort of coal and oil and gas, almost 50%. But uh, hydro again playing a fairly major role of 34%. But again, if you look at this wedge of coal and oil and gas, it's it's uh, it's it's fairly large. Bangladesh again, large component is oil and gas. Afghanistan, oil and gas again, and uh, so is the case of uh, uh, Nepal. I mean, sorry, so is the case of Maldives. And Bhutan, of course, is the cleanest of all, largely because much of its electricity comes from hydro, right? So this is sort of uh, sets the context as to why uh, or what uh, is the emission profile of these countries if you look at the uh, sources of power. Now, but having said that, and despite the fact that you find that coal uh, plays a uh, you know very very major role uh, in uh, uh, in the uh, in the in the or coal, oil, and gas, I would say fossil fuel. I will put that all in the black of fossil fuel plays a very major role uh, amongst most countries in South Asia with the, with the exception of Bhutan and Nepal. Is the per capita consumption really high? No, it is not. Now, um, if you look at the per capita electricity consumption of most countries, it's way below. It's way below the global average. Even Bhutan, which has a fairly high per capita emission of uh, electricity consumption of 2830 kilowatt hours, is, um, is slightly less than the global average, but can compare to the global average about 3152 kilowatt hours. Which means that in a lot of uh, these countries, A, um, I mean, it's not necessary that uh, development and uh, uh, high per capita uh, electricity consumption should, should go hand in hand. It's not necessarily so, but nevertheless, it also gives an indication of the kind of level of development that these countries still have to, um, you know, uh, uh, still have to go. And uh, so uh, this is where you find the per capita electricity comes up to Sri Lanka is about 742, Pakistan 4018, all well below, uh, you know, well, well, well below the global average. Uh, 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 Nepal is just 10% uh, of the global uh, or less than 10% of the global average. So this is where we are. This gives you a picture where we are. And the countries that are really low are Nepal, Bangladesh, um, and uh, Sri Lanka to a certain extent, with India, uh, Afghanistan, and Maldives slightly on the higher side, and Bhutan fairly good, or in comparison to all the other countries doing the best of the lot. Now, uh, going to the next slide. Uh, I may not be able to. Okay. Okay. Now, so overview on the, when we look at the energy access, so you look at per capita, let's look at energy access. So according to the sustainable uh, energy for all analysis estimates, there are close to 152 million people in South Asia who lack access to electricity and close to 900 million who lack access to clean cooking. Now, uh, this situation has changed in the last few years, particularly in India due to this, uh, a huge push to the LPG for rural areas, but still, you would still say 900 million and bulk of the 900 million uh, clean cooking is across the South Asia with the exception of Maldives. 
And when you look at electricity, uh, no access to electricity, Pakistan and Bangladesh top the list of people having no access to electricity. Um, I just wanted to make a point here that while India at one point of time had a large population, we do not have access to electricity. In the last five years, we have ensured, um, at least that's what the official records say, that we have 100% electrification of all villages and close to 90% electrification of all households. And uh, we should be aiming for a 24-7 electricity by 2022. This is just to set the context. So in a nutshell, if I have to put all of this in four or five quick points, what are they? Um, number one, like I said earlier, the energy sector is the largest contributor to GHG emissions across all South Asian countries with the exception of Nepal and Bhutan. Dominance of fossil fuel to meet its electricity and energy requirements across all South, uh, South Asian countries, again, with the exception of Bhutan and Nupa, uh, Nepal. Uh, per capita, low per capita uh, electricity consumption again. Access to clean, affordable, and sustainable elect electricity continues to be a burning issue in most uh, South Asian countries. And you can also add um, uh, and uh, uh, clean, affordable, and energy access for heating and cooking also seems to be a burning issue. And this is cutting across all countries of South Asia with the exception of Maldives. Um, on the positive side, now not everything is negative, but on the positive side, you will also see that this region is blessed with a very, very huge renewable energy and non-fossil fuel potential, which can be tapped. However, the pace of RE technology development and deployment across South Asian countries is not the same. Uh, it's not kept the same pace, number one. And number two, related to it, um, uh, so also in terms of the cost. Uh, uh, the huge decline in the cost of solar in India like uh, from six rupees a kilowatt hour uh, in 2015 to two rupees a kilowatt hour or even lesser 1.99 a kilowatt hour in 2021, no other country in South Asia has seen such a huge decline in, uh, uh, in uh, the price of solar uh, generation, but that could also be attributed to scale to a large extent because we've, we've you know, from, from a few kilowatt uh, uh, installed capacity or maybe in the early megawatt, uh, install capacity in uh, in uh, 2012 2013 uh, we have now close to about what 40 odd gigawatts of solar alone and close to about 100 gigawatts of renewables put together all all sources put together of renewables now okay we were talking of renewable energy potential now this gives you a snapshot of some of these numbers and a lot of these numbers are very preliminary uh, estimates and uh, and it only looks at hydro. Um, I would like to make a make a point here, a caveat here that when I say renewables, I also look at renewable plus, which includes hydro, because uh, for India, large uh, hydro is not considered is still not part of renewables in that sense. But I would like to sort of call it renewables plus, which includes large hydro. So you will see that uh, this snapshot. I'm not going to read into each of these numbers. But what it clearly shows is that there is a huge potential. And please bear in mind that I have not even touched on uh, hydrogen here, which, which again is not something that uh, uh, estimates are already there on uh, terms of potential. I've not, I've not touched on the issue of uh, uh, tidal and uh, wave power, which is again huge. Uh, and even in the case of geothermal, I've, it's only Afghanistan that has got some estimates, which could be much higher than this. And I believe Sri Lanka also has got a huge uh, <clears throat> potential for geothermal. And of course, uh, tidal energy uh, and wave energy, you know, given the fact that South Asia has got roughly about what, 11,000, 12,000 kilometers of coastline, uh, with India alone having 7,500 odd, Sri Lanka about 1,340 odd. Uh, and then uh, Bangladesh, 580 odd, Pakistan, 990, and so on and so forth. Maldives, about 650 odd. So you're looking at roughly 11,000, 12,000 kilometers uh, of uh, coastline. Uh, that's also another uh, area that one should be looking at. And of course, um, offshore wind is again, we are not taking that into consideration. Uh, but then, of course, when I say wind potential, these are all. Um, uh, onshore wind and not offshore wind. But to cut the long story short, collectively, South Asia can easily ensure 100% RE. 
a lot of countries and most of them, most of these countries have enough, like for instance, Bhutan. If you just take the 260,000 megawatts of hydro potential, it is uh, uh, 8x or 9x more than what Bhutan would need to meet its entire power requirement, even with the high per capita and even with the per capita electricity consumption shoots up much higher and reaches across the global average, there will still be enough electricity um, that uh, that country can generate that can be sent or exported to other uh, countries. So this would give you a nutshell. Um, uh, again, Afghanistan, 220,000 megawatts of solar potential, that's again pretty huge for a country that's pretty small. So this gives you a snapshot. So coming to the next bucket, having uh, sort of covered the broad compartment of setting the context. Now, coming to the energy cooperation, I've just put it into three buckets. A technical cooperation, which is more, uh, more in terms of uh, know-how, sharing of experiences, best practices, and so on. So here I would say, and, and the list can be, you could have a laundry list, but I just wanted to cover three or four broad aspects of this. One is, uh, in, this, in this whole area, there's a whole lot of experience, um, you know, in terms of uh, uh, on various fronts, <clears throat> whether it's the renewable energy scale-up front, whether it is on the energy access uh, uh, front, or whether it in, uh, it's in terms of R&D front, uh, and so on. So, and then there is also a policy framework that uh, 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 these countries have put, have experienced, um, and so this is something that they could be sharing with other South Asian countries as to how certain, uh, you know, certain uh, practices, uh, how did it lead to or did not lead to scale up on renewable energy. For example, in India, one could look at the feed-in tariff, one could look at the renewable purchase obligations. There are a whole lot of these experiences that may or may not be practiced in other countries in South Asia, but which could be uh, adopted or adapted not necessarily adopted as this, but adapted for their country's uh, uh, requirements or uh, you know what is appropriate in those countries. Uh, so I would say sharing of best practices and experiences, uh, a compendium of good policies, and a lot of states, even within India, a lot of states have put in place very good practices. Now, uh, that itself needs to be shared with other countries, maybe other states within India, but other countries as well. Then there's this whole capacity building and training programs. How do you build capacities of uh, electricity utilities in other countries? A lot of them, for example, may not have the kind of experiences that our electricity utilities have, the DISCOMs have, um, you know, uh, in, in scaling up renewables or in purchasing renewables and so on. So that could be another area and training on new technologies. I'll pack that training on new technologies for a bit and come to it a little later. And then coming to the next bucket, which is technology cooperation, joint R&D and new technologies. For example, this entire tidal and wave energy, there's no, to the best of my knowledge, there are hardly many pilots here, and we need to have pilots, and this could be done across the South Asia space. Then there's this hydrogen technology, uh, or hydrogen, the green hydrogen, so to speak. So can there be any joint R&D technologies or sharing of um, uh, technologies across these countries. And of course, sharing our patents for new technologies. Storage is another area. But again, India, you would see that storage technologies have matured to a certain extent. The prices have come down from uh, sub uh, 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 10 plus to about six plus, uh, six plus would be six plus a kilowatt hour. So the prices are falling and it's going to fall, fall further. Uh, so that's another area. And the third one is this entire bucket, uh, which I would say is that uh, green energy cross-border trade and regional grid where you maximize RE and, uh, uh, and non-fossil fuel potentials. So this would be the large area, I would say. One can uh, delve deep and come up with a lot of pointers, but I'm just sort of give you the, the big ticket sort of uh, areas of cooperation. Now, okay. Now, South Asia energy cooperation a little bit of a historical perspective. It's not that we've not had historic uh, energy cooperations at all. We have had a lot of bilateral, uh, quadrilateral, trilateral energy cooperation. Uh, yeah, the, the, the biggest sort of, a, I would say, bilateral cooperation is between India and Bhutan. 
um, you know, a lot of hydro power plants, maybe five, six of them have been built in Bhutan uh, with Indian technology or India. And uh, the power generated, bulk of the power generated from these hydroelectricity uh, electric plants have been exported to India. So you have it, and this gives you a perspective in terms of the kind of uh, energy alone. Uh, there have been 15 projects at 2.85 billion uh, US dollars, the total cost of these projects. And this is, but one thing that I would want to point out, and that's the reason why I put this slide here. Uh, if you look at some of these bilateral agreements, bulk of it, with the exception of the Indo-Bhutan, which is largely hydro, a lot, and Nepal, which is largely hydro. In other countries, it's either LNG or it is uh, uh, it is coal-fired power plant. Uh, can we get away from coal and do more solar, like the one uh, 50 megawatt solar power plant in, in Komali? Now, what are the challenges? But having said that, uh, you know, when we say energy cooperation, is it a bed of roses? Is it all easy, or is that uh, is there other issues that one will have to factor in? So what are the challenges to energy cooperation? As we all know, and I'm not going to dwell deep into this, but geopolitical situation and dynamics is a major, major issue. Um, not all the countries are friends. There are, uh, uh, what shall I say, uh, compulsions, certain kind of compulsions. Um, current situation in certain countries are not conducive for any sort of a cooperation. Uh, and, and of course, uh, even if you look at the if you want to draw pipelines, for instance, uh, or if you want to have regional grid, and then again, this, this uh, uh, you know, the geopolitical situation dynamics would come in the way. Because of that, there's a reluctance in political will. Political leaders have tried to address it, but again, there's a reluctance because of that. And that has led to a lack of follow uh, through on very ambitious resolutions made in these SARC forums. In fact, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, many of these SARC forums, I mean, earlier the SARC uh, summits, the South Asia uh, uh, regional cooperation summits used to happen at regular intervals, but now it's quite some time since we had such meetings. And then there are other external dynamics, like, uh, for instance, uh, the China factor, which I will not well into. Um, but having said that, what is the, if at all we need this, what would be the overarching objective of such regional cooperation? One, as I said earlier, and I take you back to the slide one, um, South Asia is not doing extremely well on addressing climate or keeping temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius, despite the fact that both Bhutan and Nepal, bulk of their energy comes from uh, uh, hydro, but despite that, they're not, uh, none of these countries are actually 1.5 degrees C compatible and not compliant, nor are they uh, are the policies anywhere near that. So one is, but then coming back to the earlier slides where I said there's a huge potential for renewables and non-fossil fuel, they can easily uh, be 1.5 degrees compliant. Uh, leave alone being 1.5 uh, degree compli uh, compliant, they can definitely decarbonize the power sector or the energy sector. That's, that's a, a low hanging fruit given the kind of potential. So, which brings to the next point was the energy sector decarbonization, where the energy de uh, sector decarbonization would be possible by maximizing RE potential needs of these countries. Like I said, there, there are these new technologies like hydrogen, and then India, of course, is giving a huge boost to hydrogen. Can, this, uh, can they share this with other countries too? And then I was talking about tidal energy and, and the geothermal and so on. And more importantly, and this is something a lot of people tend to miss out, uh, is that having a regional grid would also help in managing regional energy load balance. Basically here, what I mean to say is that there are these seasonal complementarity in electricity load both generation as well as demand. Um, <clears throat> uh, just to put it in perspective, in certain areas, because of the, uh, the seasonal variation or uh, winters being <clears throat> more uh, severe, there being more requirement for cooling, uh, heating load, in some places more requirement for cooling load and so on. And, uh, and in other places where there's a more requirement for cooling load, there may not be that requirement in other parts of South Asia. So how can you balance this and ensure that you don't need to uh, add generation capacities rampantly, but have just sufficient that can manage this load 
and ensure that a you reduce your expenditure by not really maximizing on generation capacities but also do this very clever uh, uh, load balance i'll stop uh, uh, stop here but then there are a couple of sites that i want to do sort of um, uh, you know refer to one is we have set up a very detailed power sector data portal which is called the vasudha power.in where you can get a lot of information right now it's india specific but there is also another platform that is the gg platform india and the gg platform india is again one of our unique uh, civil society platform uh, that was set up to uh, estimate greenhouse gases in india it has six civil society organizations we are the secretariat vasudha foundation is the secretariat and we manage the entire project the other organizations or civil society groups include cw cstat ikle south asia uh, wri among others uh, and both these sites you can get um, uh, all the data everything is uh, out in public domain easy access no paywalls thank you so much thank you mr shrinivas for such a comprehensive presentation and it definitely uh, yeah you could uh, end the slide show. yes yes so it definitely provides a lot of uh, information about the stat status in which uh, the south asian countries are in terms of their energy mix and uh, where where the prospects are so uh, i would now invite uh, ms udisha saklani who is joining us from cambridge united kingdom to share her views on the presentation and also on her work in the area yeah. udisha over to you right thank you very much so uh, first of all this was an extremely comprehensive uh, presentation and thank you very much uh, so just to give you a context of where i come from so that uh, some of the questions that i raise or some of the remarks uh, uh, that i make can be set in context so my phd actually looks at uh, at uh, hydropower cooperation initiatives and i specifically look at Uh, uh at bilateral cooperation between india bhutan india nepal in the field of uh, hydropower to see what are these new how are these new projects being designed planned as well as implemented who are the actors what are the kind of discourses and developmental uh, uh imaginaries that are driving uh energy cooperation uh, uh uh initiatives so i'm specifically looking at the adun 3 dam uh, in nepal which is being funded as well as uh, implemented by by uh, by an indian public sector company so um i i think the case for a renewable energy transition in south asia has been fairly strongly established i think countries across the region agree that there is a need given that climate change impacts uh the re the region tremendously there is a need for us to move away from fo from fossil fuels but i think what is important for us is to think about how just will this uh, transition be and by by that i mean that not only thinking about a switch in terms of uh, so not not just thinking about issues of resettlement uh, uh with gender related uh problems when it comes to planning large large renewable energy projects such as dams but also thinking about job losses li livelihoods how are we going to create new new jobs in a sector that is still evolving because moving away from coal uh means that we are we are taking away the revenue that is uh, generated from it the taxes the dividends as well as the uh, the the jobs uh, which uh, exist in the mining sector so thinking more deeply about uh, the fact that theoretically the case for a renewable energy transition is absolutely uh, true but how does it actually play out and for that we need to ensure that we have the right institutions the right policies as well as the political will uh to make sure that all segments of the south the south asian population move together and benefit from this particular transition uh interestingly when i was in nepal uh i was asking a, a lot of these actors that are actually playing a role in uh for deciding how how these energy cooperation agreements are going to be signed and uh from a layman point of view geopolitics 
and domestic politics ends up uh, uh, hijacking the entire conversation every single time. I almost feel like there are two sets of people. One is one one is uh, pre, one is occupied by the technocrats that are talking numbers and are talking statistics and are trying to make a case for renewable energy uh, for transition. And then the other group comprises. Uh, uh, activists and bureaucrats that are constantly talking about the political problems that will get in the way. Interestingly, uh, the actors who are actually successfully ma managing to push for these pro these projects have an interesting take and they say that geopolitics, that your geography cannot be controlled, it cannot be changed, so why talk about it in the first place? It's important for us to keep in mind that we try and look at any window of uh, opportunity and try and kind of capitalize on those things. However, questions such as technology transfer, so for instance, thinking about where the money for, for new technology comes from, right? And that requires a combination of not just just international funding institutions, but also national governments that should be willing to spend more money on research and uh, uh, development so that more technologies can be used. And I think this is particularly in the case of the pandemic where there has been a drastic impact on imports and so, and sort of countries have realized that they have to, they might have to increasingly rely on domestic suppliers. Uh, domestic contractors as well as materials. So it's it's important for us when we talk about energy cooperation to bring in these uh, these issues of technology transfer to think more deeply about uh, what are the social environmental impacts of these large projects that are in place. For instance, in the case of Nepal, uh, from how from what I understand, there is no regional. Uh, environmental impact uh, uh, assessment norm, which is in place. So Nepal, uh, in some sense, uh, heavily relies on the IFC standard, but the region has its own context. I think it's important for national governments to come together and to decide what are the sort of norms that have to be in place, particularly given uh, South, A South Asian region's history. It is very, very uh, sort of there, there are layers of conflicts which are there in place already. So how can we ensure that the past mistakes are not repeated? So those are just some of the things that I was thinking about. And uh, one last point that I would want to raise here is uh, the issue of uh, domestic consensus. So I, I think one in one uh, way that uh, energy cooperation in some sense has failed is the fact that I don't think there are enough communication frameworks in place or processes to make sure that people understand why energy cooperation is important in the region, why particular projects need to be implemented, what are some of the costs and the benefits of, of that. Of course, there is the SARC uh, Energy Center, there are all sorts of the BBIN initiative, there is BIMSTEC, but what are these high level meetings actually, what are the discussions going on at that level are we able to translate those, those talking points and those decisions into language that people on the ground can actually understand? Because they are the ones who are who have the first, who are the first point of impact. And if they don't understand, then there won't be enough consensus in place, which is required and already uh, a region which is uh, with, where, where the integration is so low. Uh, it, I, I think increasingly there's not going to be much success in, in, in actually implementing pro, uh, programs that need to be in place. So these are just some of my initial comments. And uh, yeah, I am excited to hear what the, uh, the other two people have to say. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Disha. Thank you for your comments. Uh, I would invite Professor Scott to uh, share his remarks. So, over to you. Oh, wonderful, thank you very much. First, uh, I appreciate IMPRI uh, holding policy forums of this kind. I think the topic that we're here um, discussing is both salient and uh, as has been pointed out by the speaker, Mr. Krishnaswamy, very timely. Uh, we uh, should lose no time in, in addressing these, these topics. We all understand uh, the critical importance, both from the compliance with the uh, NDC targets, but also I think critically as Adisha has just pointed out, 
the very real um, and important development challenges associated with energy provision in a sustainable manner uh, across the region. Um, so congratulations uh, in the first instance to IMPRI. Um, second, uh, I think Mr. Krishnaswamy has put forward some very compelling views and a, um, a case based on data. Myself having come from a science for policy background, uh, it's um, uh, refreshing, but, uh, but also um, I think challenging to hear a talk that is so well grounded in the data. Um, uh, you could envision participating in a panel like this where um, there's hand waving that uh, these are the challenges um, and these are the ways forward and so forth, but without actually grounding it in, in, in the research and, and, and the science. So um, on that score, I think um, Mr. Krishnaswamy is to be uh, commended. Let me take uh, uh, a couple of his remarks and uh, try to see if I can expand on them a little bit. Um, uh, being in a sense uh, constructively critical, uh, I think that's the challenge of a, of a panelist in this fashion is to um, take up some of the main points, but uh, see if there's some way we can probe them a bit further and then possibly have um, an extended discussion, including among the other panel members, but uh, with the audience, such as we'll get the Q&A remarks and have a chance to reflect on those. Um, coming to the, um, so I've, I'm very interested to see the broad um, brush uh, strokes of the, of the um, carbon picture in, in South Asia with the updated data. I've referred to that. Thank you very much, Mr. Krishnaswamy for putting that out so, so uh, coherently and so uh, systematically across the different countries of the region. Um, now, coming to what you've referred to as the second bucket, in other words, what are the prospects for cooperation to address both the carbon challenge, but also this development need? Um, you've put forward technical technology and regional grid. Um, I actually would, would uh, put all three of those in one bucket, uh, uh, which would be uh, technical and technocratic types of cooperation. I think the more compelling uh, need um, is this uh, political and institutional dynamic among the countries. Um, and you referred to it. So I'm not saying you've in any fashion omitted that, but I think that is where um, we could also focus uh, some of our remarks. Now, coming to both technical options for RE transition and adoptions moving from fossil fuels into uh, clean renewables. Um, I do think that um, <clears throat> the grid option that you've uh, uh, presented and that there are numerous examples of bilateral connections uh, among the countries and some degree of joining of national grids um, in, in locations, um, bears some further, uh, um, let's say, emphasis, um, not only in the diplomatic and bilateral um, types of uh, discussions, but also to show technical feasibility of those connections. I think that um, the political economy questions that we're all realizing are a great challenge for the region, um, in some senses can be um, addressed or mitigated or the first steps in that direction can be taken by showing some low hanging fruit, which could be uh, in these uh, grid connections that um, uh, we find. Now, that um, alone could present the opportunity that simply we're distributing individual countries' carbon challenges across the region by simply having a grid connections that would even out those uh, uh, carbon impacts. And in no fashion then does the South Asia region reach any of the uh, renewable targets, I think, that we're looking um, to better understand. So how would grid connections, but also technical cooperation, lead to greater renewable energy adoption? I think some of your uh, slides, Mr. Krishnaswamy, showing the great RE potential uh, were very significant. Uh, those I would characterize as being uh, technical potential estimates. Um, and as we've seen in, in, in hydropower with this notion between GAP, which is uh, actual accomplishment or installation of uh, installed hydropower generation compared to technical potential, um, that gap itself, I think, is a little bit of a misnomer, or let's say it's uh, an elusive target to simply fill the gap, I think, is, is not what we're really looking to do. Um, now, I would like to home in on hydropower, and particularly because um, several countries in the region have excess capacity. We've seen how uh, Bhutan, for instance, has both met its own domestic uh, electricity consumption, but in a fashion that also is um, leading to um, exports, which are then um, helping other neighboring countries and chiefly India to meet some of its um, electrification um, targets. Now, there's lots of uh, interesting analysis we could get into 
of uh, benefits and beneficiaries, who wins, who loses in that. And I think those are salient points, but I don't want to um, immediately dwell on those. I think uh, we need to take that as an example of the type of cooperation that could lead to a regional grid and grid interconnections as uh, aiding in those two carbon mitigation and uh, uh, sustainable development challenges across the region. Um, the reason I'm focusing on hydropower is um, right now still the installed capacity of renewables considering both um, small hydropower and sustainable hydropower, and also some of the larger um, uh, you know, uh, hydropower uh, installations across the region, um, still are where the non-fossils uh, give us the uh, greatest um, actually installed uh, generation um, capacity. So again, I'm not trying to say we shouldn't be pursuing uh, wind and solar. We should be doing that urgently and fervently. Uh, but I think um, the hydropower sector is where we actually right now and in at least the coming decade uh, have the greatest potential to pursue those types of challenges. Now, I'd refer to some very interesting work, which is um, being conducted by ISIMAD, the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development, Kathmandu, but of which all the countries of the, of the region, with the exception of, uh, of course, uh, Maldives and Sri Lanka, uh, are members, in other words, all of the Himalayan region countries, but also including Bangladesh is, uh, is a member. Isimat has done some um, very interesting work in this regard. Um, uh, I had actually requested that uh, Dr. Ramesh Vaidya be invited to this. He was unfortunately unable to attend it because he has uh, some other conflicting schedule today. Um, but some very interesting uh, work has been done by Isimad um, and looking at um, both potential across the region, but also point-to-point um, -point contact, country-to-country -country contact, the whole bilateral question versus a more trilateral, quadrilateral, multilateral uh, types of approaches to grid integration around hydropower. Um, second, I think we also have to look at um, some, some um, broader um, questions, and there's some interesting work that um, has come out in a recent paper just actually in 2021 by uh, Muntasir Moshed in uh, Bangladesh, which looks actually at how renewables emerge um, from a broader sectoral um, multi-source uh, generation um, econometric analysis using some panel data. Uh, as an economist, uh, Mr. Krishnaswamy, I think this would be of interest to you. It is a modeling study, but uh, it does some really interesting work, I think, looking at how renewables emerge as the, uh, the technology and the generation source of primary interest when you look at grid um, integration and regional energy markets. So we haven't spoken about the market question yet, but I think there are also some um, interesting ways in which regulated uh, regional markets can drive some of the technology solutions. And hopefully then, as I referred to earlier, being the low-hanging fruit, then provide some pathways forward for what appears to be an insurmountable obstacle in the diplomatic and the broader political economy um, types of discussion, which again, uh, uh, Ms. Saklani Odisha has just uh, referred to as um, being a primary uh, point of contention uh, in those sectoral uh, mid-level, let's say, uh, decision makers, uh, ministry people, and, and so forth. Um, now, the third point that I would also like to refer to is, um, and you've, ref you've mentioned it very briefly, uh, Mr. Krishnaswamy, and perhaps we could um, get into some discussion, uh, and I think you've referred to it as the China factor. Um, one of the things I think that we all are, of course, cognizant about is the pace of both technology development, but also adoption of renewables uh, in China. And uh, of course, um, being in the headwaters region of that same Himalayan um, context that we referred to, uh, Tibet and, uh, and adjoining um, uh, regions in, uh, in Yunnan, uh, in, in a sense, in my view, are part of South Asia region, though they may not be from a total country perspective defined in that way, just as you might say, well, South India, uh, Tamil Nadu or, or uh, Karnataka, et cetera, are, are they part of that, that integration in the, in, in the North? Well, through the grid connections, they may be. Now, I think the, my point is that the China factor should not be ignored. Uh, I think there are some important both opportunities there. I understand the obstacle, so I'm not suggesting that immediately um, uh, China would either be a willing or country partners of the region would be interested in the initial instance of uh, um, uh, in including uh, China in these kinds of regional discussions. But I do think that the technology factor and some of the ways forward, and we'll reserve our remarks for that a little bit later, um, show some interesting uh, potential in adjoining regions, less so of Tibet, but in, uh, in Yunnan to um, our country regions uh, to the east. 
So I'll um, end my remarks there saying um, that uh, Mr. Krishnaswamy has put forward a very compelling view of the need. I think the challenge both in your own remarks, but here's what we're discussing in the forum is precisely those ways forward. And my suggestion is that we focus on some of the small steps, uh, not looking for final solution types of uh, solutions, which can seem overwhelming and very challenging but look for some of those technical, technological, and grid interconnection, your three um, buckets, uh, or let's say your three points in that, uh, in that bucket as being uh, the next step when you combine them, of course, with the mechanisms for actually achieving those. And those are something that uh, Ms. Saklani has referred to in uh, being some of the institutional dynamics, allowing for uh, technical and technological cooperation to go forward. So I'll end my remarks there. Again, thank you. I'm interested to hear uh, what Dr. Um, Sadaq al Huda may uh, have to offer to us and then entering into a discussion with all of you. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, sir. Um, Dr. Mirza, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mehta. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Krishna Swami and also um, Udisha and Professor Scott for your very interesting uh, comments. Um, so uh, my background is on energy cooperation in South Asia. And uh, currently I'm doing some work on energy cooperation between Central and South Asia through my employment at the OSCE, because the focus of that organization is on um, Central Asian region as well as uh, broader Eurasia. Uh, so essentially, I would just like to divide my comments into two parts. Firstly, I'd like to concentrate on eastern part of South Asia, so energy cooperation between Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, and Nepal. And then I would make some brief comments about um, energy cooperation in the western side of uh, South Asia, so between um, the Central Asian countries and the South Asian countries. So um, I had the good fortune of doing some field work a couple of years back uh, in India, Bangladesh, and Nepal. And um, the focus of my field work was on the potential of uh, cross-border um, regional projects, particularly hydroelectric projects. And so I'd just like to pick up on uh, something Udisha mentioned um, regarding costs and benefits of hydroelectric projects. And I'd like to share with you guys some insights from my interview. So um, when I interviewed policymakers in New Delhi, um, they were very excited about hydroelectric projects from Nepal and Bhutan. Um, and this was the same for uh, Bangladesh. And uh, one of the things that was mentioned by one of the policymakers was that hydroelectricity is free and sustainable. So we should always uh, prioritize hydroelectric cooperation. And when I spoke to policymakers in Nepal, um, they expect, expressed a lot of concern regarding the impact of hydroelectric dams, particularly on the environment and also on the economy. So one of the issues that kept uh, being mentioned by the Nepalese respondents was that Nepal only has 17% flat land. And um, if some of this land gets flooded, then uh, you know, the country that is exporting the electricity should compensate them. And um, because of gra gravity, the water ultimately flows downwards, carrying with it the alluvial minerals and um, all the good um, you know, ingredients you need for uh, quality agriculture, and this would flow down to India. So um, the Nepali policymakers uh, feel that you know, they are being, um, uh, you know, they are, they are being, uh, you know, uh, they're facing costs twice, you know, they, they're, facing the floods and they're missing out on um, any kind of uh, positive impact on agriculture. Um, and so far Bangladesh and Nepal, uh, Bangladesh and India has not entered into any agreements regarding compensating uh, Nepal for all the costs of uh, hydroelectric, um, hydroelectric dams on the environment. Um, so the perception gap between the countries that are exposed Importing the electricity and those that are importing it regarding the constant benefits of hydroelectricity is, is something that can really um, undermine uh, these projects going forward. Um, I also appreciate uh, Professor Krishnaswamy's um, uh, suggestion that we should focus on renewable energy when it comes to energy cooperation in South Asia and not coal. Um, and this is one of the sticking points of, uh, say, the India-Bangladesh relations 
Um, so currently, a uh, coal power plant is being developed in the Sundarbans, which is the largest mangrove forest in the world. Um, and this is uh, being developed in the Bangladesh side of the Sundarbans. So the Sundarbans is, uh, is a mangrove forest shared by Bangladesh and India. And uh, currently, uh, the Rampal power plant, uh, which is a coal-fired power plant, is being developed on, in the Bangladesh side of the Sundarban forest with Indian assistance. And this has obviously raised a lot of concerns among um, environmentalists, not just in Bangladesh, but also India. So uh, when it comes to uh, energy cooperation, it is best to perhaps um, avoid um, projects that undermine uh, the environment and also uh, you know, regional cohesion. Um, on the Western side of uh, South Asia, we have um, quite a few projects being developed between um, Central Asian countries, such as uh, Turkmenistan um, and uh, Afghanistan. Um, so one of them is the TAPI pipeline, which is the Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India pipeline. Um, it was inaugurated a couple of years back. And of course, uh, because of the um, incident in uh, August 2021, when the Taliban came to power in Afghanistan, um, there is a lot of controversy around um, whether the TAPI is actually going to go through. Um, the, uh, the issue that is often missed by uh, geopolitical commentators on the TAPI is that uh, Turkmenistan has always mentioned a very good relationship with the Taliban. Um, subsequent uh, Turkmen um, regimes have, um, you know, has, have established very good relationships with the, with the Taliban, um, with, the, with the Taliban, uh, even when um, the, um, the, the US, uh, the US uh, supported administration was in power in Kabul, uh, Turkmenistan making good relationships with, um, with, the, with, the, with the Taliban regime. Um, and as a result, um, the uh, spokesman of uh, Taliban, Shuhain, uh, I think his name is um, Suhail Shaheen, recently uh, in an interview uh, mentioned that uh, the Taliban will support the, the TAPI pipeline um, going forward. But of course, this raises the question of ethics um, and you know, uh, legitimacy. I mean, uh, the TAPI pipeline will provide an enormous amount of uh, revenue to the Taliban government. Um, so uh, the South Asian countries need to consider very carefully whether it would be um, ethical to go forward with the TAPI pipeline, considering the, the, that the, um, the Afghan regime has not gained international legitimacy and uh, questionable uh, conduct and human rights. Um, some other projects that are being considered uh, between Central Asia and South Asia are the CASA 1000 project and the Tuta project. So the CASA 1000 project envisions the transfer of hydroelectricity from Kyrgyzstan um, and Tajikistan to Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, and um, these countries, uh, as you know, don't have a very good relationship with each other or a very consistent relationship. Um, and um, the, the focus of this project is to actually transfer hydroelectricity um, which would mean um, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan need to come together and um, come to an agreement on how they share their water. And as recent as April uh, 2020, there was a violent conflict at the Kyrgyzstan border. And this conflict was actually instigated by a shared water facility. So um, when it comes to uh, large scale hydro trip projects, uh, including uh, multiple countries of Central Asia. Um, you know, there could be some um, serious issues around uh, historical conflicts around water. Um, the other project that is being developed is the Tuta project. So this is um, once again, a hydroelectric project between uh, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. And the objective once again is to transfer excess hydroelectricity from Central Asian countries to South Asia. And um, in Afghanistan, uh, there has been several controversies regarding um, the actual route of the two tap. So um, the, the Hazara community, which is um, a minority in Afghanistan, have protested about uh, uh, being left out of some of the benefits of uh, these two tap projects. So once again, you have the ethnic issue 
uh, being entangled with transnational um, uh, regional cooperation. And uh, in regard to uh, Professor Christopher Scott's comments um, on uh, regional grid integration and also Professor Krishnaswamy's emphasis on grid integration, I just wanted to mention that energy transition um, is not free from geopolitics. So there's all this um, sort of comments being made about uh, critical minerals, uh, about uh, cyber security of energy transition, because as we move towards renewable energy, electricity grids will become more digitalized. And some people fear that leaves these uh, grids open to cyber attacks. Um, some of these co comments surely are hyperbolic but uh, perceptions are very important when it comes to international re relations and regional cooperation. So perhaps one of the issues that we should uh, consider discussing is how can we ensure that the geopolitics of our renewable energy are not as, um, uh, as cumbersome as the geopolitics of traditional energy. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, I would invite uh, Mr. Srinivas to respond to the discussant points that have been raised, I think, very, very pertinent. And if you could respond to them, sir. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, as I also said, thank you so much for those uh, wonderful comments. And I'll try and address them, not in any order, if I'm permitted to do so. First of all, first and foremost, uh, you know, to the point on um, getting a political will for a renewable energy transition, I would like to point out that with the exception of Sri Lanka, Pakistan, and India, all the other countries, whether it's Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, or Mar and Maldives, are part of what is called as a climate vulnerability forum. Now, the CBF, as it is very popularly called, has been at the forefront of pushing for uh, countries across the globe to adopt a path that can be 1.5 degrees C temperature rise uh, compliant, right? And all of them have been, and I, if I'm not mistaken, Maldives for, for quite some time was the president of the CVA form. And if I'm not mistaken, I think the next, it was right now with the Philippines, and I think the current presidency or likely to be the presidency is Bangladesh. And the Bangladesh prime minister has been pushing uh, hard for uh, you know, countries to, uh, <coughs> you know, come up with, update their NDCs, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and come up with a long-term uh, mitigation pathway, a long-term mitigation strategy, uh, an LTMS. So these countries, or at least the political leadership, is aware of the fact that, you know, countries, especially energy being the, the key contributor to JG emissions, that will have to be one area that will have to be addressed across the region. And so I think that's where, that, that is uh, one issue which is, which is uh, fairly well known. And particularly Maldives has been, again, they've been doing a whole lot of issues, including underwater, you know, cabinet meeting and so on and so forth to, to sort of drive home the point. Um, now, I completely agree with you, Yudisha, that, and we are doing that in India as well, that the, the, the issue of just transition is super important. But again, I would like to point out that if you actually look at just transition, uh, now it is India which is actually uh, in the region that actually has a maximum number of coal mines, okay? And there are about seven odd states that have large, large coal in Jharkhand, uh, uh, Jharkhand, Odisha, Chhattisgarh, uh, West Bengal, parts of Maharashtra, et cetera, that have large uh, coal mining area. And India is also the home for the largest number of coal-fired power plants. We have, we have close to about 205 gigawatts of installed capacity of coal-fired power plant. Now, <clears throat> so just transition would play a very, very major role in a country like India. In other countries, uh, you know, where the energy situation is still growing, I, I'm not saying that just transition need not be addressed, but then they are building up their energy infrastructure and why not leapfrog from instead of going in for the coal-dominated to a renewable energy uh, dominated uh, energy pathway is what uh, I'm saying. Now, so that, and then now talking of, uh, and then again, I'm sorry, it's not in any order, but uh, uh, Professor Scott's point that, uh, you know, the first very step is institutional and political dynamics. Again, I'd like to 
drive home the fact that a lot of these countries, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, and, uh, and Maldives, uh, understand the need to uh, mitigate GHG emissions and keep temperature right under 1.5 degrees Celsius. Now, in addition to that, there has been an institutional framework that was set, way, uh, set up way back in the 1950s or 60s uh, in, in what is called, I don't remember exactly, the Bangladesh Agreement, the Dhaka Agreement, where they looked at energy cooperation. But <clears throat> unfortunately, what has happened is the political dynamics, uh, largely the India-Pakistan, the China-Pakistan, you know, that seems to have come in the way of uh, fostering energy cooperation uh, as a region, uh, you know, for South Asia region as a whole. And that requires, I mean, that's not, I'm not sure if we as civil society groups or academia can actually address that. That's, that's a larger issue, which, um, you know, which, which uh, yeah, we all know uh, what it is. So I wouldn't I want to dwell too much on that. Now, uh, <clears throat> What we are talking of is we are not looking at facing or coal, or we're looking at facing or coal over a period of time. We are not looking at uh, immediate shift. We are not looking at a short-term shift. We are looking at a long-term shift. We are looking at a shift till 2050. So my sense that I get is that if you actually look at all the coal-fired power plants, and if you actually do all the fossil fuel power plants, and if you actually um, if you actually categorize them on the basis of vintage. Right, a lot of these, if you look at the total installed capacity in the region, it will be about 300, 350 odd uh, gigawatts, or the 205 gigawatts in India alone. Now, if you actually say that all plants older than 25 years need to be retired, right, a lot of these power plants automatically will be shut down, right? So, um, all would be good candidates for retirement. So, you are, so when you're looking at job loss and uh, you know, livelihood issues. You are not looking at an immediate shift. You're looking at a shift over a period of time. And you need to, I agree, you need to have a lot of skill building and reskilling uh, that needs to happen. Uh, and this is where I brought in this whole thing like capacity building and training and so on and so forth, which is not only meant for discount. Maybe I should have elaborated on that, but also looking at skill and reskilling, sharing of experiences, how. Uh, you know, a lot of states in India, for example, Karnataka, which was uh, coal heavy at one point of time, is now RE heavy. And how, the, how have they made the shift and, uh, you know, how have they rehabilitated the uh, uh, workforce? Now, on this whole issue of dams, I completely agree uh, with uh, what Dr. Mirza was saying. Dams or large hydro has its own issue. PR issues are flooding. We have a whole lot of issues on dams. And that's the reason why I think, uh, while I agree that Right now, if you look at base load, look at all the issues, dams would perhaps, or hydroelectricity would perhaps be a low hanging fruit. I would say that that may not be the immediate future because we, we also done a lot of analysis on the Indo-Bhutan and it's available on our website. We did this Indo-Bhutan, a uh, critical uh, analysis of the Indo-Bhutan energy cooperation, particularly the large dams. And we also interviewed a whole lot of Bhutanese on this uh, while doing the study. And there are a whole lot of issues just pursuing on a hydroelectric, um, uh, you know, pathway. Um, now, again, that then brings out to a question that one of uh, the the, uh, uh, the attendees asked on the base load issue. Yes, base load will be an issue because of the intermittency of renewables. But then that's where I I, I strongly believe that you know the uh, region should come together uh, to. Uh, on storage technologies, again, yes, we also have uh, large hydroelectricity that's already there. Uh, can we look at pump storage? There's a huge potential for pump storage. Not all of them are run of the river uh, plants. A lot of them are also large reservoirs. Can you look at pump storage? Can you also look at hydrogen technologies? So, yes, um, there are, there is a fair amount of uh, political ill will, uh, particularly between a couple of countries, which, and of course, there's this dynamism that he's this one's friend and this country is that one's friend and so on and so forth. So uh, I think when it comes to climate, um, countries need to go beyond uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the issues that they have other ways have. And we've seen that happening. If you look at the, if you look at the climate negotiations uh, under the, the, the 
the whole uh, G77 or, uh, you know, the other groupings. You have all these countries coming together and actually uh, these negotiators talking and coming up with common positions. So why can't this happen with energy too? I'll stop here for now. I'm not sure. My apologies if I've not answered all the questions, but... Uh, Yes, uh, certainly, sir. Thank you so much uh, for taking those uh, questions. And uh, also, uh, you you have also responded to the question by uh, Praharsh Patel. Um, so uh, I would like to uh, ask this question, especially to uh, Dr. Mirza, since you were uh, you have mentioned that you have done a lot of field work in the eastern part of the um, subcontinent. Um, you know, there are um, definitely political hurdles, but apart from that, uh, um, uh, and, and uh, to, to overcome those political hurdles, we need to have a consensus, which Udisha was talking about, the domestic consensus. So um, what are the major impediments in both the, in, in, in fact, the region as a whole that make it difficult for the um, energy exports of one country to gain access to into the other country, for example, uh, India and Bangladesh or India and Nepal, um, if, if you could take that. Uh, yes, um, yes. Sure. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mehta. Um, in terms of um, epistemic communities in South Asia, there isn't much, um, much of a you know, a uh, difficulty in getting the experts to talk to each other, um, especially in the last seven years, there has been, uh, you know, a, a plethora of, um, you know, training programs um, through the, uh, you know, the USA program, um, through BIMSTEC. So the experts in South Asia regularly get together and interact and, uh, you know, they undertake, uh, uh, training programs. I mean, very recently, uh, ANU hosted um, the uh, uh, energy experts from all over South Asia for a course on uh, renewable energy. Um, so there isn't much barriers uh, for the experts to interact with each other. But um, I will uh, say that there is um, issues in terms of the experts trying to get their message across to the politicians. So uh, one of the um, experts that I interviewed in uh, Nepal told me that um, as an economist, he finds it really difficult to explain to politicians about the long-term benefits of energy cooperation because politicians uh, think about in terms of election cycles. So their main objective is to win the next election. Um, you know, they're not thinking 10 years down the track, um, you know, as Professor Krishnaswam mentioned, by 2050, we want to um, achieve net zero target. So their, their um, objective is not to think along the long term. So there is that basic uh, discrepancy between what the experts want and what the politicians aim to achieve. Um, secondly, there are um, issues regarding um, continuation of uh, certain policies. So uh, um, when you have um, you know, changes in government, uh, you may not necessarily follow through on the, uh, the, uh, the agreements made by the, the, the previous, uh, previous political party. And of course, there are issues regarding resource nationalism. Um, so um, you know, many politicians will often revert to uh, resource nationalism to um, garner votes. Um, so they would use terms like, oh, you know, so-and-so neighboring country is going to steal our um, hydroelectricity and, and so on and so forth, uh, which obviously creates a lot of uh, negativity um, when it comes to public perceptions of not only neighbors, but also regional cooperation as a whole. Um, and lastly, um, there are these, um, there are these stakeholders, which one of the people that I mentioned um, uh, called them as negative stakeholders. So negative stakeholders are people who actually benefit from the lack of energy cooperation. So they be benefit from uh, the continuation of discord um, 
between certain powerful countries in uh, South Asia and uh, beyond South Asia. So, um, uh, you know, as long as you have certain negative stakeholders um, holding on to powerful positions in South Asia, regional cooperation is always going to be a stop and go process. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, there are uh, environmental issues uh, uh, in regards to uh, hydroelectricity. Um, and um, there is also issues in regard to uh, vested interests in fossil fuels. Um, so there are um, very close cooperation and uh, you know, uh, overlapping of um, political interests and uh, coal interests in certain parts of South Asia, which will prevent um, you know, the development of regional cooperation. Sure, thank you, uh, Dr. Mirza. Uh, Professor Scott, there's a question for you by Lisa Adam, who uh, I think when you had a, um, you mentioned about China, China, uh, she's asking whether China cannot be a model of renewable energy, can it be? Is it, it is undergoing an energy crisis itself, plus it's uh, 90 billion cubic uh, cc of uh, water hanging over India in terms of huge dams is an impending apocalypse. What's the way out? So I think the resource nationalism uh, thing, which uh, Dr. Mirza just mentioned, it could be applied in the Indian side of the border, uh, especially when this is, uh, this is going to come through. What uh, your your views, sir? Uh, yes, thank you. That's uh, an interesting question. Uh, I hope my marks, remarks weren't construed as saying everybody has to follow China's model. That wasn't my uh, intent. And I agree with you that there are deep problems in uh, China's own transition. Um, in fact, um, their energy growth rates are such that even with the adoption of renewables, uh, they're continuing to build uh, fossil fuel, mostly coal-fired power plants. Um, my point was that... Um, the examples uh, in China, particularly with small hydropower adoption in Yunnan to the east, um, bear some examination. Uh, there's a maturity of uh, work on both the, um, the technical and also the local impacts um, side. And to simply say that uh, the border of South Asia region is bounded by this line and any uh, you know, interest group outside um, is sort of external to the discussions, I think is missing um, an opportunity. Um, on the point of large dam storage on upstream rivers and particularly um, hydropower development with large reservoir storage uh, on Sangpo, Brahmaputra, I think is uh, of course a, a, a point for major both uh, political concern, but also um, uh, disaster risk potential of dam failure and, uh, and uh, ensuing downstream uh, floods and damages. So your point is well taken. Um, I was not intending to construe uh, China as the model that uh, everybody or, you know, that um, uh, South Asia region should follow, simply that uh, this is a compelling um, both source of um, technical innovation um, and also something that um, South Asia stakeholders should um, be intent on learning lessons from. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Udisha, if I could come to you, um, how you mentioned the whole technocrats versus bureaucrats model, and then you spoke about the domestic consensus, the need for domestic consensus. How do you actually uh, envision the, the importance of uh, continued focus on effective policy negotiations, which also takes into account the civil society uh, aspirations and also the expertise, which um, Mr. Krishnaswamy was also re referring to. Um, because you, know, you have the expertise on one side and then you have the decision makers on the other side who are purely guided by political considerations. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, your views on yeah. that. Yeah, thank you for that question. So one of the trends that has been seen in the case of South, South Asia now as compared to say the 1990s, and I say this particularly in reference to dams, but I think that's uh, the case for uh, energy cooperation in general, that there are an increasing number of what one could call no, uh, knowledge brokering institutions or sort of that that come up with new research as well as uh, uh, evidence to uh, 
to i mean they they act as a uh, sources of policy advice to governments in south asia i see it as a positive sign i feel like uh, there is definitely a dearth of uh, scientific uh, evidence as far as policy making is concerned uh, up until the 1990s we used to see an increasing uh, a huge influence of uh, western donor institutions as well as the uh, development banks from from the north that used to play a huge role in uh, advising governments on what kind of policies need to be constructed uh, while these institutions which would be called traditional donors while they continue to play a role at least in the himalayas you 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 will see that there are increasing number of local as well as regional institutions one of them being is mod that was mentioned by uh, dr scott that does play a very important role in um, working with national governments and they also work with local communities because of their they uh, because their research requires them to go out there to collect data from from the ground so i think increasingly of course there's a long way, way to go but in some sense it can be said that because of the existence of such institutions in place there is some hope that uh, that views from from local communities and from scholars are being slowly integrated in the policy making cycle i think that's a very advanced sign that is some something that we need to encourage more uh, this gap that we've had between high level diplomacy and uh, people with their own perspectives uh, uh, civil society actors scho and scholars and and, jo and journalists they kind of functioned in their own uh, in their own sphere and then there was the governance but i i think the fact that these institutions are emerging to bridge the gap that's a that's a great sign so just to give you an 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 example i remember in 2019 i was in nepal and at the power summit which was uh, hosted by the nepali private sector to kind of invite all these different stake uh, stakeholders to nepal invite a lot of investors and try and encourage them to invest in nepal's uh, energy sector regional institutions did play an important role in in bringing in the evidence that was required to back the claims that that energy cooperation is needed so i i think these institutions will increasingly play an important role and the fact that they are embedded within the 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 local and the regional polities means that there is a certain amount of legitimacy that they have that external institutions might not have so that needs to be taken into account and i think that is how how we are going to move move ahead as far as the uh, consensus is concerned absolutely absolutely thank you for that intervention so um, i would uh, ask uh, mr krishna swami this question uh, so you mentioned about uh, collectively the south asian countries can do 100% re uh, would it be possible to do to achieve this at an individual scale i mean at a at a country level or would this necessitate uh, an inter country cooperation i mean i am more uh, wishing and hoping that it could it would be um, an inter country collaboration uh, but what do you have to say about it uh, my take is this that um, maybe individually countries can i mean assuming that you brought base the definition of renewables to include large hydro uh, i presume that countries could do it on their own uh, but then um, uh, it is not whether they can do it on their own or uh, own or not it is what is the time frame or time horizon for doing so uh if you do it collectively you could possibly do it at a shorter time horizon time frame and if you do it individually it might take longer um but lastly because i mean there are intermittency issues even with hydro there would be intermittency issues so uh, it's not that hydro can generate uh, power all through the year so they may have to Uh, because of the seasonal variation and with the climate change a lot of other issues you know so so the question then comes is that uh, if we if we are able to do this balancing across the region then it might happen sooner it's not that countries can't at least decarbonizing the power sector or the energy sector um, could be done um, uh, into uh, independently in each of these countries it might take a longer 
period of time. Right, sir. Right. So, as a follow up to this uh, question, there is a question by Siddharth Arora who asks that um, one of the major challenges in renewables is the financial backing of the project. In contrast to thermal plants, where the returns and profitability is achieved in a shorter time as compared to the renewables, specifically in the hydro, uh, hydro projects, what can be done to incentivize more investment into renewables, such as the hydro energy in India? I think this well, is very important here. Yeah. That's not that's not really true, right? Now, if you actually look at um, uh, uh, okay, so let's let's sort of make it more a data driven answer to it. Now, if you look at costs, right? Uh, cost per kilowatt hour. Solar was ten rupees in the uh, in the uh, in the early two thousand when the National Solar Mission was set up. It was about ten twelve. I think it was earlier, it was even 18 rupees a kilowatt hour. It's now come to 1 rupee 99 paisa. Okay. If you actually look at coal, uh, coal was in the region of 2 rupees a kilowatt hour. It's now actually gone to 3, 350. So if you actually put it in perspective, the new coal is costlier than the new solar. The old solar is costlier than the old coal. Okay. But um, I, I hope it's not confusing. So the, the new coal is costlier than the new solar. The new coal is costlier than wind. Now, if you do solar or wind with storage, it is slightly more expensive than uh, coal, but that is also going to uh, be addressed. Um, uh, and uh, the storage price is also coming down. Now, uh, in India, uh, for renewables, you have what is called as a must run status. So, which means that any electricity that is generated, renewable energy that is generated, will have to be evacuated. So, your what is called as curtailment is reduced, is very minimum for renewables. Now, uh, but uh, if you look at coal, uh, uh, the uh, what is called as a plant load factor, which is how many days the coal fired power plant runs and operates, and how many hours does it operate, you find that earlier. Uh, it used to operate at a PL of about 70-80% and now today the average of uh, PLF is about 50%. So what is actually happening is a lot of these coal fired power plants are operating at below optimal uh, levels and when they operate at below optimal levels, their profitability also reduces. And, uh, and if you actually look at the parliamentary question that was raised a, 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 a couple of years back, there are a whole lot of coal-fired power plants that are actually getting into the category of standard assets, which means that they are actually making loss. That's interesting. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, so, yes, I would now move to the end uh, or to conclude towards the program. I would invite um, each of the panelists' views on how do we actually create an open, efficient, uh, rules-based, transparent energy markets, and also wherein all the countries in the in the subcontinent are actually uh, collaborating with one another for what is the overall aim? The aim is energy security for. Uh, for whom for the people right so um, that has to be avail available affordable and accessible so what do you think and also uh, if any one of you could also throw some light on the uh, waste management of um, solar power you know uh, we are having so many uh, we are having the international solar alliance and it, the focus is on solar energy but then 25 years 30 years down the line we are going to have so many uh, solar panels just uh, lying waste because their uh, half life or full time is like 25 30 years so what are we going to do with that isn't it going to uh, create another set of challenges in terms of management of waste, solar waste. So if you could throw some light on that as well, and then uh, we could conclude. So your views on the way forward. I would start with uh, Dr. Mirza. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mehta. Um, in terms of moving forward, um, I guess if you look back in the last seven years, there has been many firsts in South Asia. You know, we had the very first um, India-Bangladesh uh, 
trans cross border transmission line. You had the very first, um, uh, you know, regional pipeline between uh, India and Nepal, the friendship pipeline. Um, and for the very first time, India, the Ministry of Power in India actually changed its guidelines to allow um, trilateral cooperation before it only allowed bilateral cooperation. So there has, there has been, you know, significant progress in uh, energy cooperation. But um, I guess what would really, really, um, you know, make energy cooperation sustainable in South Asia is to um, agree on some form of social and environmental standards um, uh, of, um, you know, the, the implementation of these projects, because these projects are bound to have um, huge costs on uh, the most vulnerable sectors uh, of our economy, as Udisha mentioned. Um, and um, as Professor Krishna from mentioned, um, South Asia is one of the most vulnerable countries in the world, uh, one of our vulnerable regions in the world uh, when it comes to climate change. So um, I think it's very important to uh, identify certain standards. Uh, they don't necessarily have to uh, be a copy and paste, a cookie cutter approach um, uh, when it comes to international standards. It should have some kind of uh, regional ownership but we, of course, they can be informed by, uh, you know, IFC standards um, and other, uh, you know, international uh, standards, uh, the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative. Um, but uh, I think agreeing to some form of standard will uh, really help us move forward in envisioning how regional cooperation actually facilitates sustainable development and not just the, um, you know, the interests uh, of uh, elites per se. Um, in terms of the question you asked uh, regarding um, electronic waste of uh, solar panels, um, this is also something that uh, needs to be uh, perhaps led by India and um, perhaps India can bring together the other countries of South Asia on finding ways to um, deal with electronic waste. Um, I guess it could very much be a part of uh, the energy transition process. Um, you know, as as um, as we know, critical uh, some of the critical um, materials re required for uh, solar panels and wind turbines are um, very difficult to mine and are also controlled mostly by uh, China and um, uh, to some extent Russia. So um, in that context, uh, the recycling of uh, some of these uh, rare earth minerals uh, becomes very important. So uh, I think solar panels um, and the recycling of these panels are um, perhaps uh, even um, disposing of them in a sustainable manner should be perceived uh, or conceived um, um, within the whole, uh, uh, energy transition uh, process moving forward. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Mirza. Uh, Professor Scott, over to you. Uh, yes, in sum, I think uh, the group should consider carefully at least uh, two pathways um, le leading forward or along the pathway leading forward two major concerns. One I have is the notion that we assume that uh, climate change is fixed and given and that we understand very well what the impacts are both in terms of uh, the 1.5 C future, but also what the implications are for infrastructure in, in the region to meet those kinds of targets. I don't think we have done an adequate job uh, on that. So looking at, and we'll see what uh, the COP26 results actually um, bring forward, but um, the different AR6 working groups, I think have actually done a good job in um, doing that. I have contributed in, in small ways in, in two of those chapters. Um, but to really think through more carefully climate change, not simply as the driver that changes that uh, or sets that future um, set of targets, um, but what are along the way, what are the um, impacts that we're likely to um, expect? And I think from the hydropower side, um, that is the change in the whole um, hydroclimatic regime that would actually lead to the ability of hydropower to continue to 
to meet future needs or, or not and less so. So then that baseload question came in um, also choice of technology and so forth, I think are important uh, points to consider. The second one, and uh, maybe I'm reading too much into your remarks, uh, Dr. Mehta, um, that you said that uh, what is it that we need to get to um, for an open free marketplace and so forth. Let's be careful of market only solutions. I think this will have to be a very heavy, heavily regulated um, type of market. Internally, we obviously have the energy regulators, but I think we are also gonna need a South Asia regulatory um, body. With all of the political economy implications that that will have, this goes to uh, Dr. Uh, Mirza's point also about standards. So in my view, it's not only the environmental and the social standards, which I fully agree with, but I think it's also uh, market me mechanisms, um, standards for uh, looking at uh, regional integration. Uh, and then the final point is, um, I think that some of the multilaterals and even the external to the region, and this is partly my remark uh, on, on China earlier, though it was more in the guise of sort of the technology, um, uh, understanding well what the technology and adoption um, type of um, examples are. Um, and again, not from any model perspective as, you know, this is an ideal, but what are the lessons learned from um, uh, adopters who've had more mature sets of experiences over longer periods of time? But I do think that and this is again, it's the COP26, um, uh, at least the next point in it being in, 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 uh, in Glasgow, is to really try to understand how um, international um, multilateral um, bodies, um, including um, on the finance side, uh, multilateral banks and others, but also the rising consensus uh, around global solutions and global finance and global mechanisms to uh, move forward along the path. So those are my uh, short remarks in this. And again, thank you for the opportunity to join the panel. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, Udisha, over to you. Yeah, so uh, I think these are all great points. And the one the one uh, point that I would like to uh, sort of mention here, I think it's the role of uh, institutions, stronger institutions for sure. So just as we know that I, I, I mentioned it in my remarks that there is a SARC uh, uh, energy center in place, but what exactly are the national focal points if one if one particular country wants to engage in a cooperation mechanism with the other one do we have these systems in place are these processes in 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 place and right now it seems to me like that is not the case uh, uh, which also leads me to the other point that we need to make sure that there is data, there is a data transparency as somebody who researches who is uh, re re researching um, uh, the energy sector in this region, I can tell you that finding data on demand and supply availability of different countries is a huge challenge. Uh, even, I mean, the data is often not updated. Um, the, the most recent uh, data available at times is 2012, 2011, and then projections are made based on that. Even in that case, data is not reliable. There's a lot of confusion about potential, about, th about theoretical potential of uh, hydropower and how much should actually be tapped should should be tapped into. So I think data becomes extremely important and the governments have to work towards ensuring that there is the transparency in place because in the absence of it, what it does is that it creates a lot of doubt and uh, suspicion. Uh, projects are signed and they are in, they are implemented without people fully understanding uh, the basis on which these things are taking place. Uh, the other thing that I want, wanted to say is, um, I think there's also a need for us to move towards uh, towards some kind of harmonization uh, of domestic and regional energy trade policy. There is no doubt that with uh, India already bringing in energy from Bhutan and now with the uh, with the Arun three uh, soon to be completed, putting uh, power to India. But governments are still in that phase where the conversation around uh, the 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 policy framework has still not been finalized. Uh, geopolitics often gets in the way, and we have to make sure that we have both the processes taking place together. I feel like Nepal has taken large strides. For instance, it has come up with new institutions to ensure that there is more regulation in place. But even till I mean, my my fieldwork shows that there is quite a lot of confusion between departments and ministries about who is responsible for what. So I feel like the pace at which uh, things are happening is quite fast, and countries have to find a way to 
to keep up with it so that we don't have a situation where projects are implemented and we are ready to go, but we don't have the norms and the standards and the, and, and the regulations which will make sure that this cooperation takes place in the right manner. Absolutely, that's very true. Thank you. Yes, uh, so I would uh, now invite uh, Mr. Srinivas for his concluding remarks. Um, so I actually got two points. Um, one, um, you know, I didn't mention about the LMDC in the chat. Uh, there is already a like-minded developing uh, country grouping, which uh, uh, has uh, these countries, uh, many of these countries as members. And we do, uh, as part of the LMDC, they do negotiate at the uh, climate meetings uh, as a grouping um, and have common stance. So can, can that thinking also go into addressing climate change um, as a collective uh, in the region? Uh, you know, which, which then uh, um, uh, sings all the other differences that we have between countries, but actually look at energy cooperation as something more overarching. I know it's easier said than done, but nevertheless, can that uh, be one of the thought? Uh, second is I completely agree with what uh, Dr. Sadakat said. Um, I think we should be very careful um, to ensure that the environmental and social issues are not forgotten. Um, yes, again, it's very easy to say large scale renewables, 100% renewables and so on, which all of us are in, uh, which many of us are in favor of. But having said that, uh, we should also take cognizance of the fact that uh, solar does require huge amount of land. For every megawatt of solar, you require four uh, acres of land. And if you only go in for ground mounted, large utility scale solar projects, um, then, uh, you know, we'll be, uh, uh, there'll be a huge amount of land grabbing. So one will have to, and which will then, uh, um, you know, impinge on environmental and social issues. So one will have to be very careful. So when we're looking at a 100% renewables, one will have to ensure that, you know, what kind of land, what kind of a regulatory uh, structure that you have, not just, and I completely agree with Dr. Scott that you need to have a regional energy regulator, perhaps, uh, who can bring in all together all of these issues. That's it from my side. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much to everyone. I am so grateful. Uh, this discussion today has actually been very enriching and fascinating. And I think this whole topic of uh, energy cooperation in South Asia is extremely significant. And it requires continuous brainstorming and conversations like this. And uh, because, you know, our mandate at IMPRI is, is also to ideate and inform policy. Um, so the outputs of such exercises would be very key uh, in efficient I think is the panel we're on, but we've lost Impri. Yeah, that's right. We're not able to uh, hear you, Simi. Dr. Kumar, are you with us? We see your... Uh icon there, your image. Uh, we've lost Simi, but uh, Arjun Kumar, are you there? Well, all of you, it's been a pleasure to meet you and uh, learn about your interesting work. And uh, I have been enlightened this morning, so thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Lovely to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Keep in touch. Bye.